and it's, it, it, it is a little bit basic I suppose um, in its delivery on the spectator side of the camp but as far as the, the riders and everything is concerned it's, it's great so I think we're going to have a very interesting year that is for sure God help us with our predictions uh, moto three up next let's move on uh to the third tier uh tate took his first ever pole position joined by two rookies on the front row as well including the home hero mario aji in third but it was i suppose finally arriving better late than never for uh, the, a championship contention i know it's only race two but he didn't really seem to be there in race one dennis fosher dominating to take his first win of the season he found his way to the front uh i think it was lap four and pulled away with ease pete in the end and uh, guevara in second so fodger well this was kind of what you'd expect from the runner-up last year that's right yeah i guess this is what we were expecting for qatar but it, then he, he had the double penalties didn't he and it mm. just all went downhill from from there in, in qatar but so it's a bit of a, a, a belated start to the season but yeah, I mean, it was an early breakaway and, and that was it. He was gone, wasn't he? And um, stayed out of that battle behind. And then likewise, Guevara just sort of got a bit of breathing room in the last sort of lap or two. It left that big group fighting and, uh, you know, which kept everyone entertained to the end. So, yeah, I mean, Foggia, he, he's got his season going now. We saw Mino, the round one winner, taken out by Sasaki. He's got a long lap penalty for Argentina for that sort of mistake, let's say. Um, but that's obviously hurt Mino's points and, and helps Foggia having scored badly in the first round and now got his win on board. So yeah, I think uh, he, he might be the start of something for Foggia. The others won't want to let him uh, build momentum, I think. Talking at the start of something, Scott Ogden. I'll tell you what, looked good in qualifying, qualified ninth, third row of the grid. Michael Lavert, his MLAB Vision Track um, racing team, brand new this year. And Scott Ogden, he's looked good and he carried it on. OK, 13th, he scored points in a tough, tough class where everybody is quick on very similar motorcycles. I think Scott Ogden, you know, done a great job this weekend. And uh, I think 13th, OK, he'll be maybe disappointed with that because all racers are disappointed with anything other than winning. But the fact of the matter was it was a great performance from him in, you know, tricky conditions out there. There's no doubt about it. So keep an eye on Scott Ogden. He's... Uh, you know, he might have been a good pick by Michael Laverty. He looks um, looks like he's pretty useful at the moment. And he doesn't seem to be overawed at all by the big GP bubble. You know, he gets his head down. He's a real, He seems like a realistic kid that's um, working hard towards his goal. But the qualifying ninth, third row, second round of the year, bodes well. Good stuff from uh, Ogden in Moto3. We'll uh, move back up to MotoGP. And I, I wanted to pick up on just a couple of other things that... Uh, perhaps may have gone under the radar I don't know definitely not with you two but you spoke about the Suzuki uh, riders and especially Jai Mir really enjoying the grip out there but one person we haven't really spoken about so far this year we spoke about his teammate Alicia Spargro putting in some great runs in the Aprilia but Mavic Rinales hasn't really quite found his feet just yet with Aprilia has he Keith how have you made his start to the season? He finished 16th in the end, 37 seconds off the lead in Indonesia. Well, I think you've just said it really, haven't you? It's the equivalent of when you, you're going out in such high-class quality company and you have to switch to the second page on your monitor in the garage to find yourself. I mean, that's just like the most demoralising thing there is in the world. Anybody that hasn't raced, um, in the corner of the garage, of course, is a monitor, usually... They only have one and um, and, it, and it goes down to sort of 14th place or something in its um, timing capacity. And then you have to flick it onto the next page to find yourself because you're, you're off the pace that far. And it feels like that a bit with, with Maverick. I mean, you always have these false hopes, I think, with Aprilia to an extent. It always looks, and with Maverick at the early part of the year, you know, Aprilia has looked really good. It's there or thereabouts. It's made improvements this year. Alicia Spargro is... is He's hanging on with it. He's gripping the, taking the opportunity. Maverick, he always looks good in pre-season testing. And then we get to the real stuff where you've got elbows out and bump and barge. If you don't qualify that well, you have got to have your elbows out. This is going to be, you need some thinking capacity here to, to be able to make these passes. I alluded to it earlier on with Zarco. Zarco, whether it was in his head or whether it was in the bike, only he will know because we can't tell from watching on TV. 
but he couldn't make the kind of moves he needed to make to get himself up front in the Murder GP race. He looked like he had the pace to do it. I was disappointed because he didn't do it. Quattararo came across them all and cut his way through when it was when it was time. Might be that the Yamaha just did what he needed it to do a little bit better in those passing places. And I think the same thing with Maverick. When he's in amongst everybody, people are bullying him and pushing and shoving and you've got to take your opportunities as and when they fall. We've talked about the track, you know, the lines on the track were you know, slightly tricky anyway. There was, you know, from testing, there was only a meter wide line. That obviously got a lot wider by the time we got to race day and a lot more bikes running on the track. Then we had the rain, which was huge, which in your head, you would think that you'd lose a bit of traction on the track. The track would have, you know, washed the rubber out of it and made it a bit slipperier. But of course, in reality, as you've just said a minute ago, the likes of Mir coming from something like 17th on the grid through to where he came through to in the end and feeling the grip. Maverick doesn't strike me as the kind of guy that would be able to take that that kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, momentum forward. He's not a Darren Binder who's going to risk it every inch. We talked about that earlier. Mia on the Suzuki is a very confident motorbike, and if he can feel the grip, he can feel the momentum and get forward. I just get the feeling that Maverick is still a little shy on, on that kind of situation where a lot of bikes around you, iffy conditions, it's not really Maverick's sort of set of circumstances that are going to make him ride well. I haven't written him off at all. He's a fantastic rider, Maverick Vinales, is a really good rider. But he just seems to need too many boxes ticked before he's at his best. Definitely the early laps, as you say, Keith, from what Maverick was saying, he felt that he lost too much time. He lost something like 15 seconds in the first four laps. Something we haven't mentioned is a lot of riders were struggling with visibility. It was almost it was mud coming up. It was almost like that. You had riders wiping the visor with their hand, which Keith will explain, you never do. I mean, because once you do that, it's desperation, isn't it? It usually makes it worse, but they were that desperate, some of them, they couldn't see. The screens were, even Jack Miller said he was sort of peeking over the, over the screen and he was at the front. So it, there was a lot of riders that were sort of caught up, uh, let's say in the pack in those early laps and, and struggling to sort of see where they were going. Mir actually said he was following the white line. I mean, he couldn't see where he was going. <laughs> and then he said, he said, said, see the line turn in or a red light from a bike in front and he'd follow it. But it's, it was a really difficult conditions early on with the, with the dust and the amount of water. So, but coming back to Maverick, yeah, he, I mean, he's, he's, he's been saying things like he's, he's struggling with a similar sort of problems to last year that he didn't have in testing. It's strange that he was, he was really happy in testing. And then he's, he sort of gone back to this, some of these issues. He was happy after the race, believe it or not, on Sunday. He was saying it was his best day of the year on the Aprilia. He felt that he, they made progress and things like that. But yeah, we'll, we'll have to see, won't we? I mean, it, it's, you've got to deliver it, haven't you? And he's he's targeting sort of Hareth onwards. He wants to make the most use out of the concessions. Aprilia can do this private testing. And I think he's he's really looking at that to try and get himself to make this step forward. But certainly the, the early laps, and he's got to qualify better, basically, as Keith was saying. He, he's either got to qualify better or he's got to stop losing time in these early laps. Of course, the test didn't really do anything for anybody, did it, when you think about it? Certainly not for our predictions anyway, because um, <laughs> the difference between the test and the actual race weekend was so massive. Honda were nowhere. I mean, even Paulus Pargro, who, like his brother Aleish, we know he can stick a lap in. Um, and couldn't do anything with it. So the, the the differences between the test and the actual reality of racing was just massive. Um, I think it comes back to that testing thing. I, did, I think, did I ask um, Danny Aldridge and co about, yeah, I did, about concessions and stuff like that. I was always, always a little bit concerned about the fact that we had so little testing early on in the year and so many big decisions have to be made before Qatar regarding what you are gonna run for the rest of the year, what you are gonna be locked into for the rest of the year. Aprilia still have concessions, but no one else does. But I was a bit concerned that because we were coming off the back of a technical freeze, um, we'd only got a couple of tests, really. Okay, there were shakedown tests and stuff like that, and rookie tests. But we'd only really got a, a small amount of track time to make a decision on to, to what specification motor that all the other riders other than Aprilia were going to have to run for the entire year. Um, and that was going to be locked in at Qatar which always seemed to be wrong to me. I always felt like it should be by the time we get to maybe round four. You know, so these early ones, they could have, and I think from a spectator interest point of view and from a from a, a team point of view, you know, to be able to make decisions while they're racing and during free practice and bring another unit and the like from a, from a 
you know, a journalistic point of view, from a fan's point of view, it would have been a much more interesting start to the year rather than seeing people like Honda perhaps in a bit of trouble and Yamaha with not the, you know, 10 mile an hour off the top end that they really need to find from somewhere. If that, you know, that lock-in had been moved, you know, for, further into the start of the season, it might have been a bit more of an interesting year. Not, not that we're going to be short of things to be interested in, of course, but I don't know what you think, Pete. I don't know what everyone thinks at home. I mean, uh, let us know. And, and I think also, Keith, the point, the reason it's sort of been made worse this year is is that one of those tests was Mandalika, as you said before. So if, if it had been even just two tests, okay, you could, as, you, as you're saying, have more testing, but also when, when one of those tests is basically a tyre test. I mean, Paul Espargaro, who was probably the most outspoken with these problems, he said, look, the, the test was a waste of time as far as the race weekend. It had nothing nothing to do with the race weekend. Once you change the tyres and everything else, there was nothing they could carry across from the test to, the, to even the race weekend. So, I mean, if that's the case, how do you how do you carry anything into the whole season if you can't even carry it across to to the, to the specific race weekend <laughs> and you've got to make decisions on engines and everything else? And I think I think that would you know as you're saying Keith it would certainly increase the interest it would give the factories a bit more time we've got this situation with Ducati having three different engines haven't we where they they haven't really been able to pick exactly which of the 22 engines so they've gone with a hybrid for the factory team mixing parts from last year and this year and and things like that and you do wonder you know was that just a time thing because also they made that decision they've got to build the engines for Qatar haven't they maybe if they'd have had more time they could have put all of their riders on that hybrid engine but to build all those engines and then get them to Qatar for that homologation cutoff, maybe that just wasn't possible. Maybe that explains why they've ended up with this kind of split situation. So, yeah, I think this, you know, there doesn't need to be this rush, does there? Of you know, everything has to be done at Qatar. I think when you've got so little testing, and especially when one of the tests is really just a tire test and a new track, yeah, give give them give them some more time to try things out. We all like to see changes on the bikes, don't we, and technical stuff. So, yeah, I, I don't see why they, you know, that should be seriously considered. I think as well, because we came off the back of a technical freeze because of the pandemic, I think the fact was that you would have expected a bit of a logjam engineering wise to have been there. So it would have seemed particularly this year. I mean, you can't think retrospectively, of course, because I don't want to criticize Dawn and the FIM or ERTA regarding any of this or the MSMA. You know, they, they've all got a hand in it. They all must have been thinking something similar to what we're talking about. And um, they decided against it. Otherwise, I'm sure it would have been extended. But it did seem it does seem to have, 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 have mired certain certain factories you know it's uh, it's something that i think that that really technically i think that it was too soon the cutoff point at qatar was was too soon for me and I, and i'm fairly sure there're going to be a few people that think that and it, and it is probably too soon as well when you look at the uh, the championship standings to read into this you bring up the idea of Ducati and how we thought at the start you know cause with so many bikes they had on the grid this year they'd be dominating only two Ducati riders are in the top 10 of the championship standings but it is an Aya Bastianini who leads with 30 points and uh, I think the who's the second Ducati rider it's Joanne Zarco now up into fifth um, but it's Bastianini, Binder and Quattararo now the top three in the overall standings so uh, uh and and harry to be lead, sorry to, but to be leading the world championship with 30 points out of out of 50 i mean 60 percent of the points available and you're leading the world championship i mean that i mean last year zarko i think he had 40 points so he, you know and the year before that quattro had 100 percent of the points in the first two rounds i mean this is where we've gone in just the space of two years i mean amazing i couldn't believe it when you when you looked at the championship standings and, and bastianini he was 11th wasn't he in the race on sunday and he's still leading the world championship i mean yeah incredible really. <laughs> it really sums up just how unpredictable uh voter gp and and how competitive it is this year um still only at the end of round two though we'll have another one uh not this weekend weekend off so no predictions this weekend thankfully we can ha have a reset and have a little bit of a think before we get back to it the following week when we go to argentina um but we'll leave it there for now gents thank you very much for your company as ever we will be back next week to look ahead to Round three of the MotoGP World Championship. In the meantime, though, make sure uh, you're tuned in, as ever, across, across crash.net for all the latest news and analysis across the week. And then we will be back with you for more next week. Get your questions in the meantime. Leave them in the comments section or tweet Instagram, Facebook us. Just search uh, Crash MotoGP. Please do leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts. And we will see you right back here next week. Please stop sending, sending me pictures of Kenny uh, Rogers and Kenny Rogers 
Roberts. I've uh, really dug myself a nice hole on that one. So uh, hopefully we've cleared that one up. But until next time, bye-bye.